Okay. We might just get started. All right. Thank you for coming. Welcome to Allied Health Virtual Conference. My name is Serena Jones. Um, I'm the director at Allied Health Support Services and I'm also the co-founder here at Allied Health Virtual Conference. I will be your host for today's session. So welcome. Today's session is constraint-induced therapy for the upper limb. Thanks for joining us, whether it's live or you're catching the recording. You probably want to do both, I would say. All right, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. Questions. We welcome questions, so please send them through. We'd love to, to hear from you. The way to do that is by using the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen there. Um, so the Q&A function is actually being disabled. So please use the chat function, type it in. Um, Phil can't see what's going on, so he's going to do his presentation and I'm going to manage the questions. We'll probably hold them till the end um, if that's okay. All right, participants should also be on mute and your live video feed will be off, so don't worry. We can't see you, we can't hear you, um, so you can, you can um, relax and enjoy the show, as it were. All right, lastly, please be respectful to your colleagues and your peers. I do reserve the right to remove you from the session. Okie dokes. So our wonderful presenter today is Philip Fay. So Phil is an occupational therapist by trade and he was the first therapist in Australia to be trained in constraint-induced therapy at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, USA in 2009. So today he manages a private practice in inner West Sydney called Constraint Induced Therapy Australia, where he and his team see a wide range of clients, both adults and paediatrics, um, and achieve amazing results. So without further ado, welcome Phil, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Serena, and uh, thanks to uh, everybody who's uh joined us so i won't uh, i will uh, just share my screen here and hopefully you get this up okay so yeah as um serena alluded to uh, I am an OT with about 30 years of experience. Um, just let me make sure you can hear me. Uh, Serena, can, is that coming yep, through? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Your, your sound is great and we can see exactly what we need to be seeing. Thank you so much. Go uh, for it. Okay. So, uh, so um, this morning we're going to be talking about CI therapy. We are going to concentrate a little bit on the upper limb, but I just thought it's worth noting that uh, CI therapy is also um, useful for both speech um, improvement uh, following neurological injury and also very useful in improving uh, lower limb functions again post uh, most uh, neurological injury. Uh, most of the studies have been done on stroke um, and um, originally um, the work uh, that was uh, that led to the development of CI therapy was done on uh, primates and we'll talk a little bit about that um, but the main thing that um, I want people to um, think about is if they're not currently doing something that uh, looks uh, hopefully um, very much like CI therapy for people who meet the, the movement criteria is that they should be uh, they should be looking at uh, at doing that in some way um, so from 2010, it was included in the stroke guidelines and um, that was um, updated last year and um, it uh, is telling us that we should definitely be doing this um, with people who meet the uh, criteria. The criteria we'll talk about in a little while. So Serena's already said uh, most of this, but yeah, I'm the founder of uh, CI Therapy Australia. Uh, we provide um, therapy, CI therapy to those groups of people, CP, MS, um, and TBI. Uh, we also do some training across Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, uh, that's a one or a two day training course. So if anyone's interested in having us come and uh, do some training in their organization, let us know. You do get um, a couple of free spots if you uh, help us to run courses outside of Sydney, so um, worthwhile uh, thinking about. 
So I just, uh, this is the 2010 guideline. And as you can see, uh, constraint induced therapy is category A um, evidence. Um, uh, interestingly, task specific training is category B evidence. Uh, however, task specific training is actually part of the CI therapy uh, um, training intervention. So this is uh, the uh, schedule that I hope to cover today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of it and talk about some of the early research that led to the development of it. We're going to talk about some of the applications in the acute setting, the subacute setting, uh, the, uh, the application with kids and with kids it's important to realize there's a developmental um, uh, complication and there's also the complication of when the injury actually occurs. We'll have a chat a little bit about that. We'll talk about the, uh, the in-betweenies, um, which are the 10 to 20 year olds, which there isn't a lot of um, research done on uh, yet. A few studies, but not many. We'll talk about who's a good, who's a, who's a not so good candidate. We'll talk about some of the assessments that we use um, in CI therapy. Uh, we'll cover the interventions. We'll talk about home practice. And then we'll take a few questions, hopefully everything goes as expected. So what is CI therapy? Uh, so CI therapy is a, is a family of interventions. Um, so there's, there's typically four interventions that, uh, that comprise CI therapy. Uh, unfortunately, um, when it was first named, uh, it was named around the, uh, the restraint um, that you typically see. Um, so that can be a splint, a a, a cast, a mitt, um, many things have been used as a restraint, but um, that is only a small part of the actual intervention. Uh, the other important things uh, that comprise the intervention are uh, strategies to enhance a change in behavior of your clients, uh, very intensive task practice within a clinical uh, setting or can, can be done at home. Um, uh, an intervention called shaping, which is an intervention with a focus on achieve on achievement and on upgrading um, the uh, problem solving of uh, transferring skills into the real world, uh, giving lots of uh, coaching, which is uh, giving people uh, feedback about their 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 performance, uh, positive feedback. Um, uh, making sure that the interventions that you provide are activity based. So there's a relation, uh, there's a direct relationship between what you're doing and what the person that you're uh, working with wants to achieve. Um, and also that they're successful. Uh, one of the, one of the things I see often um, in clinical practice, is that um, that clients are often asked to do things that are a little bit beyond them in the hope that that challenge will somehow um, allow them to progress. Um, we need to be right on the edge of what they can do, but if it's too difficult, then they're not going to get the a significant. They're not going to get enough uh, practice to make a difference to um, to to their plasticity. Uh, so that is something that we will talk about um, as we go through. Um, so there, there are essentially two types of CIMT. There's the classical protocol, which is a six hour protocol. Um, and there's anything else which is called uh, modified CIMT. So the classical protocol involves, um, as I said, lots of uh, interventions that they are um, shaping the task practice the home practice, the use of a restraint 90% um, of the time, um, the use of the motor activity log, which is a, which is a standardized assessment uh, as part of the assessment process, but also as part of the intervention process. Um, and the, uh, the assessment of, um, of a person's uh, cognitive, uh, their speech status, uh, the medical status, 
to ensure that they they meet the minimum criteria um, that we know um, has the the where where we know that people do the best from receiving CIMT. Um, so, um, as uh, Serena said, I trained at the University of Alabama back in 2009. They were the originators of this uh, concept. A gentleman by the name of Edward Taub back in the late 70s, early 80s was doing uh, um, research on primates. Um, and he kind of stumbled across this idea of learn non-use. And they tested it in um, in primates uh, first, and then they started uh, developing um, research looking at stroke and TBI firstly, and more recently uh, the application to children, and then to um, to other conditions like Parkinson's and uh, and MS. Um, as I said, the original protocol looked at had six hours, um, so that's really what we call the classical CIMT and any other interventions less than six hours are really modified CIMT. Um, and there's been a very, uh, uh, there's, if you, if you do a Medline search, you'll find up to around 500 articles um, of us on CIMT uh, or, uh, or constraint induced therapy um, now. And there are various, uh, lots and lots of um, different ways that it's been applied. Uh, so CIMT is not, uh, it's not forced use therapy, although um, forced use therapy was one of the, uh, one of the uh, types of therapy that uh, really also led to the development of CIMT. So forced use therapy is really um, just forcing the, uh, the arm to, to do something. So you might tie them into a set of pedals or um, it's forcing the arm to do something but it's not necessarily directed towards a goal or directed to the main aim of force use therapy is to increase the, the, the activation of the limb. And in the studies that were done by Stephen Wolf back in, uh, again, the early 80s, um, there were some um, improvements in the motor ability of the limb, but not as much in the actual functional capacity of the limb. So it, it definitely improved motor function using a forced, using forced use, but but that motor function was not necessarily useful. Um, it's not just the use of restraint. Um, Krista Broder in uh, Sweden um, in 2009 did some work on, um, on using the same uh, protocol as the EXCITE trial, um, but without a restraint. And they had uh, very similar results. So we know that if, um, if you attend to um, the other elements of the uh, of the program, um, and it is possible to get very similar results without using a constraint. Um, we do that sometimes, um, depending on the uh, on the client, and uh, um, I'll talk a bit about um, how I decide uh, on that. I've got to say, most of the time, I do use a restraint, um, particularly in the first three to four or five days, uh, because you need to break that habit of just um, using the uh, unaffected arm for things where they could be trying to use the affected limb. Um, so CMT is, CIMT is not disability focused. So we're not thinking about the strength. We're not thinking about um, the disability side of things, the spasticity side of things. Um, although those two th things do improve using CIMT, it's not our main focus. It is something we assess um, because it may be something that you might get somebody to uh, to work on uh, before embarking on a CIMT program. Typically, I do that if somebody has a really weak shoulder, and uh, but so that I don't have to spend most of the uh, CIMT program working on shoulder um, shoulder movement. I will get them to give them a program to work on um, for two or three weeks before they start the the uh, CIMT program. Uh, it's also not motor learning focused or again, the motor learning um, happens as part of it because you're doing, um, you're doing activities that, uh, that require motor learning, um, but it's more focused on success and, and pitching the uh, activities at the level that is just doable 
for our clients. Uh, so I thought I'd just show you a little video um, of a client who I worked with. This is not an upper limb client, this is a lower limb client, but he was uh, actually one of the first people I worked with after doing the training and I had been working with him before, um, but I decided that we'd apply the principles to this uh, boy who had um, um, who has cerebral palsy, uh, 17 years old at the time, and um, I'll just show you him. Uh, he was referred to me um, by one of the neurologists I work with uh, because he'd fractured his uh, metatarsal and was um, not um, not walking very well. And he, uh, I do some work with a with a movement disorders clinic, and uh, we were going to do some Botox, and I decided we would do the Botox and do a lower limb CIMT program with him. And um, you'll see this. Oops. I'll be able to show you um, him before the okay, again, go back. CIMT intervention, but after the Botox. And then about three months later, after the Botox and after the CIMT lower limb intervention. So one of the things that does happen um, during CIMT is people's confidence levels, um, it, confidence in their own abilities um, is increased. And, and that certainly is part of the intervention. Um, a lot of the time uh, they've tried uh, to do things and they've failed. And um, um, as part of the shaping exercises, we uh, develop their confidence because we are uh, picking activities that they are able to achieve. And that's a very important part of um, CIMT. So as I uh, said with these, uh, some of the things, some of the history of CIMT, and um, I guess it started uh, back in the late, um, or the, you know, the late 1800s with Sherrington and Mott's original um, neurophysiological deafferentation studies where they looked at monkeys and deafferented them and monkeys weren't able to uh, weren't able to, to use the deafferented limb, and then they concluded that uh, that sensory information is the most important thing in um, in whether or not uh, somebody would be able to use a limb. Um, uh, Dr. Taub was um, actually looking at that those particular studies um, when they discovered that in fact um, after a short period of um, shock, uh, those animals could be induced to start using that deafferented limb um, if uh, you did some interventions which included the restraint of the limb and also uh, using, um, using shaping as a particular um, intervention. So I'll show you a picture. Let's just go forward here. There's Dr. Taub, who was the was, was the original founder of uh, this concept, and uh, still works at the University of Alabama as, a, as the head of the unit. Um, and this is one of the original photos of um, of the uh, animals. Um, and you can see there um, that is a food reward, and that's the affected limb. And they're retrieving them out of a uh, little well, um, which was started as a big well and got progressively um, smaller. So that's, um, that's the idea of uh, shaping. Um, the other limb, which is the unaffected limb, is constrained by the, by, the, uh, by the wooden post there. And he's induced to try and use that limb because he wants to get the food reward. Um, so after doing some studies um, around the, the primates, they they, uh, they did several studies where they where they used the constraint for a few for different time periods, and they concluded that um, it, the 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 restriction of use of the effect, unaffected side had to go on for a period of time um, in order for the changes that were happening to become more permanent. Uh, if you only left, or if you if you didn't restrict them for a for a couple of weeks at, at least, 
then they, they just went back to, um, even though they were able to use the unaffected limb better, they just went back to using the, uh, the, the unaffected limb um, as they had been doing before. So that was the start of the, um, the thinking around this concept of learn not use. Around the same sort of time, there are a couple of other studies that are important. Um, there was a study by Stewart, which was done um, on uh, uh, stroke, chronic stroke survivors. And that was in a day hospital setting in the UK. Uh, they looked at what the person um, with the stroke was doing or capable of doing within the day hospital setting. And then they looked at what they were actually doing at home. And they, they, they found a, a difference of between 25 and 45% in in their actual use uh, between the two settings. So they concluded that sometimes people's actual ability um, wasn't matched with, with what they were doing. And um, uh, again, this is um, in part due to, uh, to learned non-use and in part due to, um, due to just the, the, the environment at home probably not being as conducive to, um, to, to people doing as much as they can. So that could be a carer doing more than they need to or should do. Um, could be uh, down to the therapist um, not telling the uh, carer uh, what is the best way of um, um, the person continuing their rehab at home. So there, there's a lot of reasons that this might, uh, might occur, but it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, that, was, uh, that was a finding. Um, we discussed uh, one of the uh, studies of, with, uh, uh, learned with the, the forced use that uh, Stephen Wolf um, did. Um, one of the other interesting um, studies that also came out um, a little bit later, which started to show um, some of the other um, things that were involved with um, CI therapy is the uh, change in motor maps following shaping Randolph Nudo in 2001, I think published the first um, um, transcranial magnetic stim um, paper, which showed uh, changes in motor maps following um, and following a shaping uh, intervention. Uh, then coming a bit closer to where we are now um, in 2006, the, uh, the, the EXCITE trials was published, which is a CMT specific trial. Um, and that was a multi-centre trial at the time. It was the biggest study um, of any rehab intervention um, and uh, it was done over a two-year period and um, uh, the, the, the patients undergoing the intervention um, did much better than the, um, than the, 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 the other group uh, that they were compared to um, who had a similar uh, length of time in their uh, intervention. And then those uh, people who didn't receive the intervention were crossed over and they also improved under the CIMT um, 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 intervention. Um, also the, in the acute, in the acute um, CMT has been tested um, in a couple of, a couple of authors, Dramatic, uh, and in 2014 um, um, was also, um, there's also a study uh, from uh, Norway both of which um, showed improvements in the CIMT group versus the, um, the comparable intervention. So we'll just um, show you the, the concept of the learn on use. So remembering back, this is the uh, early 80s and they didn't have any um, fancy um, other um, MRIs or other things that they could um, explain this um, non-use by. Um, Dr. Edward Taub is a behavioral neuropsychologist uh, as well, so he was obviously very interested in the, uh, in the behavior that was seen. And so it seemed like um, the, the, there was a depression in the system. Um, unsuccessful attempts um, led to less attempts. Um, and then learn on use was um, eventually became a more permanent um, situation. As you can see there with the in advent of CI therapy, there was increased motivation, increased uh, limb use, uh, positive reinforcement, 
that led to further practice and further reinforcement. There was then use dependent cortical reorganization uh, and then the uh, learn non-use became uh, less of a less of an issue. So that was back in the uh, 80s. That still all applies today, but we also know a little bit more about neural, well, we know quite a lot more about neuroplasticity and there are obviously some other um, things that are important that we know, now know are happening. So I'll just flash forward a little bit to, to the other um, things that we know that are happening. So uh, we know that there's, co there's cortical use reorganization, which was um, a concept that was coined by uh, Donald Hebb, who was a psychologist uh, in uh, 1949, and um, he came up with this idea of nerves that fire to together, wire together. Um, it wasn't until 1973 that two other psychologists who were doing memory um, memory research um, really proved that uh, this um, actually happened. Um, and uh, they um, they coined this term long-term potentiation, um, which explained this rule of Hebb. Uh, and that is that neurons fire together, that fire together, wire together. Cells that act together strengthen and preserve the synapses, and that's long-term potentiation. And the greater the number of stimuli, the greater the effect, which is very important for us in terms of the dose of therapy um, that's needed to uh, improve, to, to encourage use dependent plasticity. And also that uh, cells that aren't or that can't or aren't used are pruned or they're also, or, or inactivated. Uh, and that's particularly important early in the condition because um, we still need to be thinking about how we can um, get people trying to use the limb um, to try and uh, stop that inactivation of cells or in the case of kids, to stop the pruning of cells and to make sure that they develop their, to their uh, full motor potential. Um, this is the uh, this is a slide from the study by uh, Nudo, uh, showing the TMS results of um, following following the shaping intervention, and this is done on squirrel monkeys, and they had an induced stroke. You can see on the bottom. Uh, left-hand corner, a little um, area of infarct uh, that was produced. These, uh, uh, and then you can see um, in the the no rehab uh, area the motor map that was present for the hand, and in the in the the uh, the rehab intervention, you can see a much bigger representation of the hand as a result of the rehab intervention. So we've got some neurophysiological um, data. And uh, we also now have some um, fMRI data. And uh, this is a study that was done by uh, Lynn Gauthier, who was a PhD student at the University of Alabama uh, back in 2008. And this was looking at adult, um, the adult um, the CIMT uh, program that was being run there. And they did a, a, a voxel-based pomometry uh, which is basically a quantification of uh, grey matter. And uh, so this study was looking at, how, at any changes in grey matter following CIMT uh, and following, so this is a four, four, hour, pro, four hour protocol that they were, they were looking at. And uh, so you can see here, um, um, they looked at the, uh, the change in real world scores as scored by the motor activity log, which is a, which is a, which is an inter, which is an assessment um, that I'll talk about in a second. But you just need to know that it's a, uh, it it shows um, a change. It shows it, it's a stud, It's a an assessment of uh, real world activities, uh, and you can see a change in in that, um, and also you can see a change in the contralateral the ipsilateral areas of um, the brain uh, and also the hippocampus, which is where we think uh, new brain cells are born um, after the CIMT intervention. Um, in the comparison group, you can see uh, no changes in those areas. So they concluded that um, there was 
use dependent contralateral and ipsilateral reorganization and that there was some uh, stimulation of neurogenesis in the hippocampus from doing CI therapy. So I'm just going to go back um, a little bit. Um, just talk a little bit about the acute studies. Um, so because it is important that we really start this as soon as possible. Uh, so Dromedic in 2009 was the first person um, to do a study with very acute and this was called the Vectors study. There were 52 clients. Um, now they were um, very early onset. So from, um, from four and a half days to, um, to a couple of weeks past uh, their stroke. He had three groups. Uh, they were what they called standard CIMT, which is two hours a day, uh, with a MIT use six hours a day. Um, they had high intensity CIMT, which was three hours a day with 90% of MIT use. And they had traditional rehab, which was whatever was happening in the uh, particular hospital that was doing it at the time. Interestingly, their results, um, and they used the ARAT action um, research arm tool. Um, test, uh, sorry, to um, uh, as their motor, um, one of the motor assessments. Uh, they used the stroke impact scale. They also used the, uh, the FIM. Um, and what they found was that the uh, clients that did the best were in the low CIMT group, um, followed by the control, followed by the high CIMT group. And they concluded that that may be because um, people in that acute early stage may not have been able to actually make use of and um, there's some question as to whether or not that doing that uh, amount of intensity uh, may actually be detrimental in the early stages. There's some support of that concept given by the AVERT trial which also found that uh, people who had in the very very early stages uh, had more intervention um, did, slight, did worse than people who had um, slightly less uh, uh, intervention in that early, in that very, very early uh, stage. So we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly, but um, we do think that, um, that once the person's medically stable, and so this may be different depending on the sort of severity of the stroke. So people who are more severe, it may be prudent to wait a little bit longer. Uh, people who are less severe and more stable, uh, it may be, uh, may be um, worth doing uh, straight away. Um, you'll need to discuss this in your particular uh, setting with the doctors that you work with, um, bearing in mind the, the guidelines and, um, and work out what best fits for wherever you are uh, planning to do this. covered most of that. Okay, so we'll move along to the other, um, the other things that we now know are important and this is a concept of interhemispheric inhibition. And so this is um, the, an interesting uh, thing that happens after any kind of injury or change in cortical activity that may be caused by disease like Parkinson's or, or any of those other, uh, or MS, um, that um, there's a change in cortical activity. Uh, so there's a down regulation of the side that's affected and there's an up regulation of the side that's not affected or least affected. Um, and this is greater the larger the injury. Um, this is then reinforced by, uh, by use of the unaffected limb. Uh, so this um, then becomes the cycle. Uh, then the compensations will, uh, after a period of time, actually really become uh, the new normal to the person. Uh, so these compensations reinforce that electrical imbalance. Um, and so the constraints um, in constraint-induced therapy are aimed uh, to reduce this imbalance. Uh, so that's a very important part of how constraint seems to, uh, to, to work. Um, I often get asked this question, so I thought I'd put this slide in. Um, 
they're really um, from the Excite trial, which was a very big multi-center study um, it, with uh, clients receiving the intervention within that first 12 months. There were no um, there were no adverse events um, of having done uh, a very intense um, amount of therapy. You do need to make sure that the clients that you see have been checked over by your medical uh, team to make sure that there aren't um, other comorbidities that uh, may uh, may be a problem. Um, and you also need to think about things like. Um, if you're putting a constraint on during a particular activity, is that person going to be safe? So some of the things that we don't, we don't use a constraint in is we don't use a constraint when the person's walking, if they need to use a walking stick, we don't use a constraint uh, in the bathroom. Um, if they're standing up, we may use one uh, if, um, if they're sitting down and they're being supervised. So you have to think about safety and the use of uh, your restraint your restraint device and uh, whether that's uh, whether that's a safe activity for the person to do with the aim that we we want them to do more rather than less of course um, and as I say with the with the results of the very early studies we we're still not we're not sure about to what level the um, the intensity should be in that first couple of weeks, um, but once they're medically stable, um, you know we we need to be getting them doing, hopefully at least a couple of hours of intensive training each day if they meet the uh, criteria. So we won't screw that. Um, this again is uh, another um, question that I often get asked, so I thought I'd put this slide in. Um, and that is, um, isn't the IMT just extra practice? Uh, because a lot of the CIMT studies, um, you know, have three, two, three, four hours of intervention a day. Um, that's a very good, and uh, very, um, very good question. But in the uh, studies um, where they compared the uh, CMT intervention with the same, the same amount of practice uh, of another intervention, um, uh, which is done here in this first plot. Uh, you can see that uh, where CMT is, is compared to a, a, another intervention, and um, um, you'll need to look up all these uh, studies if you're really interested. Um, you, you can see that um, in most of the uh, studies, um, the, the outcome favored uh, CIMT. So um, no, it's not just the extra practice. There's actually something about the the, the way that CIMT is um, is, is done, um, all the components of it, that uh, that makes it a very effective intervention. Um, and uh, so one of these things I believe is this motor activity log. So it's uh, part of the assessment. Um, and if people aren't familiar with it, I, I would encourage you to go to, um, go to rehabmeasures.org and um, have a look at it as a scale. It's a very um, well validated scale now, for particularly for stroke. Um, and it's just a, a 30 item scale of everyday functions um, that is scored um, out of from zero to five. And we look at how well the person can do an activity and also whether or not they're in fact doing that activity. And um, so it's used in the intervention as an intervention. Um, we, we do the first uh, 15 items of the scale of the um, how well scale uh, every day um, of the intervention um, with the aim of both encouraging the person to do some of the, some of the activities that they, uh, if you think that they are capable of doing. Um, so you encourage them to do things that they're not doing, uh, encouraging them to do more of things that they are doing. Um, it is also used as a problem. So we use it to, uh, to, to work out why somebody isn't doing and uh, maybe we can, uh, we can intervene by, um, by changing that um, task some, somehow to, to allow them to, to, to attempt it. Um, so all of the uh, interventions that are used in CIMT are aimed at 
increasing the activity of the affected side and uh, and restricting the activity of the unaffected side for a for a, for a period of time uh, some of the other assessment criteria that is these are used in the um, in the in the research studies and some of these um, are not necessarily things that should limit you from doing them but um, balance um, is one so um, again this is something if you uh, are worried about the person's balance um, then you obviously have them sitting you have use what other uh, ever other equipment you have um, in the research study they, they need to be able to walk for five meters um, they need to be able to hear uh, well enough to understand what you're telling them they need um, in the research study they need 24 out of 30 of a mini mental state exam um, I don't think that's definitely necessary. They do need to be able to understand and they do need to be able to um, to comply with um, what you're trying to do. So um, I've done uh, CMT with, with clients who are around that 2021 mark um, on the MMSC and they've done uh, very well. So it's, it's not a, a criteria that is an absolute criteria in the clinical setting, but it was something that they looked at in the research setting. Same with the aphasia, they need to be able to understand enough to participate and they need to understand enough um, to, uh, to, to, to indicate yes or no to things, or they need a carer who's able to um, help them participate if they don't have that level of understanding and they meet the other movement criteria. So here are the movement criteria and um, so the main ones are looking at the active movement in the fingers. So um, generally now um, we look at at least some movement in the index and the, and the little finger um, of 10 degrees um, uh, extension. Um, we also need to have a little bit of extension in the, uh, in the thumb um, to, to meet the criteria. Um, they should have some shoulder flexion, 45 degrees, um, and they should have some active um, elbow flexion and extension. Uh, so they're the main criteria. Um, so the bulk of the research around CMT has been done on uh, people who are, who are labeled as a grade two or a grade three. Uh, that just describes the amount of movement they have in their fingers. So we're now looking at um, patients who are grade four and five, which are the people who have very, very limited movement in their index and their, and their little finger. Um, and um, again, CMT has been used in, in those low functioning um, people uh, with improvement as well. Uh, they're obviously the most difficult ones to, um, to improve. And uh, in my clinic, I do use CMT with them as long as, as well as robotics, uh, electrical stimulation and other things. Um, so um, it can be useful uh, with those clients as well. Um, typically in most of the, in a lot of the studies they've used a Wolf motor function test. It's what I use at my clinic. Um, I think it's a good um, test. It's um, freely available um, and it's, uh, it, it's um, well validated and it's a reliable uh, measure and um, there are shortened versions of it for both chronic and subacute uh, so it doesn't take the, the, the streamlined versions take roughly um, 10 15 minutes to to administer and the full version takes uh, between 20 and half an hour to administer so it's a good uh, test of, um, of of motor function we also do sensory tests um, and uh, range of motion testing before we start. Um, so sensation doesn't exclude people from uh, doing, uh, the lack of sensation doesn't exclude people from doing uh, CIMT. Um, in fact, uh, in the pediatric literature, uh, it's now been combined sensory retraining with um, motor retraining using CI therapy. Uh, with, with improvements in both the motor function um, and also sensation. So it's definitely not something that um, is an exclusion criteria, but it is important to know. Uh
uh, because um, it may be something that you want, it would be something you would want to work on during your CIMT to, um, to because um, you probably won't have time to do it as an, as an, as an adjunct. Um, so that brings us up to some of the interventions. Uh, so the interventions in CIMT are shaping. So shaping is a, is a form of um, task practice where activities are progressively made harder uh, and the complexity of them can be, um, be made uh, more difficult uh, and they're practiced many, many times. They're usually tasks that only last uh, a couple of minutes. Um, they're recorded in terms of recording the actual, um, the, the outcomes of the task so that we can give uh, feedback that includes um, feedback around the quality of the movement, the speed of the movement, the accuracy of the movements. And these are all based on your assessment of the person's motor control issues. And um, so you decide um, what you think, uh, what shaping activities you think are best going to address the person's motor uh, deficits. So task practice, that's another important component of CIMT. And again, these uh, in my practice are uh, based on what the person's told me they want to improve. Um, so we make it as relevant as we can. So the task practice can also be uh, extensions of the shaping. So, but these are typically, um, we typically try and um, do the full task. Now, um, some of these tasks will be ADL type tasks. They may be eating, drinking, uh, things like that, maybe putting on putting on a shoe, they may be putting on a sock. So sometimes they may involve things that require two hands. In the initial part of the CIMT, I encourage people to, for the therapist to act as a second hand. And then later, once we've um, decreased the interhemispheric inhibition, uh, then for the client to use uh, both hands um, together. Uh, in the CMT intervention, we also use a behavioural contract. The behavioural contract is just a formal agreement that's signed by the patient and the carer and the therapist uh, on the use of a restraint and also on the other things that you want them to do at home and in the clinic. So they understand that it's a, that it's a, uh, it, the importance of, uh, of doing all of the, uh, all of the bits of the CIMT, not just the work that you do in the clinic. Um, it's imperative that you, uh, you impart to them that doing the uh, practice at home is probably more important than actually doing the interventions in the clinic. And so you can make your own uh, behavioral contract up, it just has to have uh, what, what you're going to do. Um, it has to have the the use of a restraint, when the restraint's to be used, when the restraint's not to be used, um, and the activities that you're going to be doing um, at home that's signed by you and by the, uh, by, the, by the carer or by the client. Then there's the use of a constraint, um, so, oh, sorry, a restraint, and then the use of constraints. So constraints are any and all interventions that are aimed at the at increased activity of the affected side. So they may be rules that you uh, put in place. So one of the rules that I always have is if somebody's going to assist you with an activity, you have to try at least three times before they give you assistance. So it's very easy for people to intervene way too early um, before the person's actually tried. And this is usually because carers don't like seeing the uh, the, seeing somebody struggle with something, but in fact, you know, we we need to to try, or we need to tr to try something to be successful. Uh, so um, so anything um, that is aimed at in increasing the activity of the aff affected side is a, is a constraint. Um, we also use a restraint, which is any mitt or glove or cast aimed at limiting the ability to engage the unaffected arm. So you can, that could also be just sitting on it. Um, um, from the work of Krista Broder uh, in, Nor in Sweden, um, we know that uh, restraints may not always be necessary, um, but if you're not gonna use a constraint, you really have to be very, um, very hard on the, uh, 
uh, intervening to stop them from uh, casually uh, using the unaffected side when you don't want them to. Um, so some of the important things about CI therapy is its emphasis on uh, real world transfer of skills, uh, emphasizing function, uh, em emphasizing patient accountability by using the, the, uh, the, the, the home skill assignments, uh, by using the behavioral contract, by using the, and by, by using the motor activity log at the beginning of each session and checking to see that homework has been done. Um, we, we, we want to, the person to be successful and this is a really important thing. You must select your activities that are not too hard, particularly in the first um, four or five days of um, starting. If you start too hard, then you will disengage the patient very quickly. Um, motor learning is not um, the primary purpose. Um, it does improve uh, strength, also not the primary purpose of CIMT and will improve as part of the program. Um, home, home practice is emphasized. Um, so I'm just going to finish off here with a couple of um, uh, a couple of little short videos of uh, a couple of things. Now this uh, client was practicing a full task. Here she was trying to isolate her index and other fingers. So this is a shaping task. Uh, this is another shaping task again in a different setup with some auditory feedback. She was trying to press these buttons. Again, trying to isolate her fingers. Um, I just thought I'd include this last uh, slide, which is um, something I did when I was doing a presentation out at uh, a hospital uh, a couple of years ago and uh, just after I'd started um, just to show uh, what some of the results that we were getting with uh, CIMT. So these are the first 11 patients that I saw in my clinic um, and you can see there their initial motor activity log scores and their final motor activity log scores which was done over a two-week period and you can see there there was a significant change in their um, functional um, uh, abilities um, so typically this is what we kind of see, even if they're low level, so those who start lower, um, uh, they improve uh, similar amounts. Um, and those who start slightly higher, um, they finish slightly higher, and, uh, but they, they, they seem to improve uh, similar amounts in terms of their actual uh, final level of function. Some, some do much, much better than expected. And uh, to date, I've only had uh, one or two clients out of the 70 uh, clients that I've now worked with using this approach uh, who haven't done as well as uh, expected. So that um, takes me to the end of my uh, presentation. Hopefully you've uh, learned uh, something about CIMT um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi Phil, thanks so much for that. Uh, really great, valuable content. I'm, I do have a couple of questions. First of all, um, are behavioural contracts really necessary? I know personally I'm an OT as well and um, personally I'm, I've got them on board until I pull out the contract and then they start getting a little bit antsy. Do you find that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, some I've had a few people flatly refuse to yeah. sign the um, behavioural contract. Um, I think that's uh, that's okay. Um, but if you're not using it, you still have to 
uh, you, you have to make sure that the person is actually really bought into it. Um, yeah. I ask the question of, I always ask the question when they don't want. I've only had a couple of people who flatly refused to do it, um, but you you have to make sure that they're bought into it. Um, one mm. of the people that uh, didn't uh, sign the contract um, also didn't do a lot of the other things, and so mm. um, you know, for me, I don't see that as much because most of the people that come to me are in a private practice. Yeah, so, uh, most of them. But um, certainly, when I was working in public health. I did have uh, some people who um, were less bought in. Um, at some point, you then have to decide whether or not, um, if they're not putting in enough, and they don't, you know, it's a big time. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's a big amount of time that you do them, so uh, you have to decide whether or not it's worth um, it's worth continuing. It just depends yeah. on 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 I guess how they're. Um, on their compliance with the other things. So if you're seeing that they're not complying with the other things, they don't want to mm. use the MIT, they don't want to do the home practice, mm. those sorts of things, then I guess if you have a policy around that, um, you could terminate the, um, the, the, the intervention. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. You and in public health, in, I'm in public health in outpatients and um, we have that conversation a lot. <laughs> around exercise programs and compliance and motivation. So, I, you know, it's just an extension of that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's really why, you know, these other behavioural interventions are there because, you know, you're really trying to ensure, you're trying to get more more compliance because we know if more compliant, the better they're actually going to do. Yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. There's also uh, yeah, one the more question. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Yep. So the answer is, it's not absolutely necessary, but you, but you better make sure that they're on board um, yeah. if you're not going to use it or if there's some reason they don't want to use it. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, and just one last question at this point. Um, do you know of any studies comparing the different, uh, some different types of modified constraint programs? So, for example, um, you know, time-based versus task-based or do you know of any studies? Um, no, there are some studies comparing the the amount of time, mm. um, but it's always a little bit tricky. It is a little bit tricky because sometimes they just compare time, and, the, and yeah. you're not sure about the number of repetitions and things mm. like that. So uh, the, one of the reasons they they stopped doing the six hour program at the University of Alabama was because what they found when they 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 did a comparison of actual practice between their six hour and their four hour time, and they found that. Um, in fact, there was not a big difference in the actual mm. practice time. So people doing more um, because they were getting more tired um, had longer rest breaks and things like that. So in yeah, the sure. six, hour six hour program compared to the four hour program, they found there was only a difference of about 27 minutes in terms of actual yeah. practice. So, yeah. um, so they were doing a lot more um, so it is, it is difficult. Um, what we do know is that, um, that less, that there's an effect definitely in people when, when you're able to do it for an intensive time um, over, a, over a shortened period of time, so two, three, four weeks, um, mm -hmm. but the effect gets less the longer you, you do that. And from the pediatric studies, the, the, the hours, seem to be, you know, that you need to be aiming for is around that 30 hour mark. Um, yep. That's over a period of time. So that's what you should be aiming mm. for. That doesn't mean that they have to do all of that with you. Um, some of yeah. that obviously needs to be done at home, but if you want to uh, try and aim for as a minimum, I think about 30 yeah. hours over a two, three, four week period. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so we have quite a few of attendees and I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, we can, I'm sure Phil would welcome some direct questions or, or emails so we can make sure that that his email address is on our website. So again, thanks so much for joining us, Phil. Fabulously valuable content um, and uh, you know, a reminder for all of us how important it is. It's always interesting to, to hear the backlog, the backstory and the research around that um, for busy clinicians. 
So go back to our website, have another look, Allied Health Virtual Conference. We have a stack of clinical and business-based conferences coming up and more are added every week. So hop on over there. And lastly, very exciting, this year we are hosting Allied Health uh, awards, the Australian Allied Health Awards. So this is a national gig. It's big. There's prizes and cash and glory all up for, up for grabs. So hop on over to our sister website, alliedhealthawards.com.au and nominate. Alrighty. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. There's um, lots more exciting events coming up. So hop over to the website and have a look. Thank you.